Welcome everyone. This upcoming Saturday, April 22nd, there's Earth Day. So I wanted to do a video. Why do we have Earth Day? The purpose of Earth Day is to bring greater awareness and education to every global citizen about how the Earth's systems function so that each person knows what they can do to live in harmony within those systems. Earth Day is meant to inspire action to protect the environment. Today I'm going to talk about a little bit of history and an overview of Earth Day and at the end I'm going to give you some ideas of what you could do if you'd like to participate. So make sure you watch until the end. You may notice my voice sounds raspy. I'm just getting over COVID. I had to record this voice in segments because I'm short of breath so hopefully you can hear me okay. But I really felt it was important to do this video because in my opinion Earth Day is probably the most important day of the year. Because a healthy planet is the foundation for everything. If we don't have clean air, clean water, we don't have our health, we don't have our livelihood, we don't have anything. I just feel like we should have a national holiday every year, a global holiday every year for Earth Day, and all participate, do something. So I really wanted to make sure I did this video. It's really important. And um, thank you for watching it. And now let's jump into it. In the Pacific Northwest, in 1854, that was 167 years ago, a beautiful speech was delivered by the great Chief Seattle, now known as Chief Seattle. The speech was written down by Henry, Dr. Henry Smith. Here is just one small snippet from the full speech. You may recognize this. This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. This we know. All things are connected like the blood that unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Treat the earth with respect so that it lasts for centuries to come and is a place of wonder and beauty for our children. Okay, and then it skips a few more paragraphs and towards the bottom of the speech, it continues. If we sell our land to you, love it as we have loved it, care for it as we have cared for it, hold it, hold in your mind the memory of the land as it is when you take it, and with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your heart, preserve it for your children and love it as God loves us all. One thing we know, our God is the same God. This earth is precious to him. Even the white man cannot be exempt from the common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We shall see. Chief Seattle delivered this now famous speech to his tribal assembly in his native Duwamish language in 1854 as words of friendship and goodwill to white men who wanted to buy the land. In the decades leading up to 1970, the year of the very first Earth Day, industries churned out massive amounts of smoke into the skies and sludge into our waters. There was almost no regulation and no accountability from the press. Rivers became increasingly toxic and skies darker and everything smelled. It was nothing like it is today. It's better today. I remember as a teenager in the 19, early 1980s, I would fly into Houston to visit family. And as I left the airport into, and I walked out into the humid air outside of Hobby International Airport, the smell would hit me. and it was actually a comforting smell, sadly, because it, it was full of smog and car fumes, but I associated that smell with coming home, so I liked it. I mean, I didn't actually like the smell, but I had a comforting association with the smell. It's amazing how when you're completely entrenched in something, you don't see how it could be harming you. I have asthma. Who knows what that did to my lungs over all those years. But you just don't know any different. Fortunately, decades later, now when you fly into the airport, it's better. There's still more work to do, of course, obviously, but it's definitely better. That smell and that smoggy car fume smell is not there anymore. 
And that just shows you we can make progress if we set our minds to it. So that's just, you know, one of many examples. Then in 1969, in Cleveland, Ohio, there is the Cuyahoga River. All along this river is a lot of industry, or at least it was back then in the late 60s, or in the 60s. Um, and this industry was so dense that the river was just completely uninhabitable. You didn't want to touch the water. You could see oil slicks all the water surface, and nothing lived in there. You didn't go fishing. You didn't go swimming. And along the edges of the, of the, la of the river, they had cars, old cars piled up along the riverbank to kind of prevent the erosion. So it was, it was really bad. And in fact, there were numerous fires throughout the year where the, the, the river itself, where the river itself actually caught on fire. So the locals were aware of this. They were, I guess you could say they were used to it. But um, in 1969, a little mishap with Time Magazine in their photos caused the story to go nationwide, and it blew up. So what happened was, in the 50s, there had been a, a pretty bad fire on the Cuyahoga River where a tugboat caught on fire, and the flames were reportedly five stories high. But when Time Magazine wrote the story about the 1969 smaller fire, they actually, they, I think they mistakenly used a photo from the tugboat in flames from the 50s. And that's the story that ran across the nation. So <laughs> people thought that we were having five-story flame fires on the Cuyahoga River in 1969, which, you know, probably wouldn't have been out of, the, out of the question. But the story spread like wildfire, excuse the pun, and everybody paid attention, took notice. And this was just one of many things that happened in the 60s. You had Rachel Carson's book that came out, Silent Spring which talked about the uh, chemical industry and how they had been lying to people and how the government wasn't really paying attention and regulating them. The press wasn't calling them out. So she went to Congress and fought for um, the truth. So this and many other things were building up to uh, a climax. And there was a senator named Gaylord Nelson. He had this idea, we need an Earth Day where everyone just learns about the earth, cares about the earth, and does something. So he had seen the anti-Vietnam anti War protests on college campuses all throughout the country in the, six, in the late 60s, and he thought, we need something like that. He proposed the first Earth Day to be in 1970, and is now often referred to as the father of Earth Day. He drew inspiration from the teach-ins that happened in college campuses and envisioned the same type of grassroots environmental demonstrations were needed to shake up the political establishment and force the issue onto the national agenda. Nelson was governor of Wisconsin for two terms, during which time he created the Outdoor Recreation Acquisition Program, which funded the purchase of one million acres of land for parks in the state. Later, after he was governor, he served as senator, for 18 years, during which time, which time he authored legislation to create a national system of hiking trails and also the 2,100-mile Appalachian Trail system. So thank you to Gaylord Nelson for the Appalachian Trail. He also sponsored several other important pieces of environmental legislation, including the Wilderness Act. In 1969, at a conference in Seattle, he announced his idea and invited the entire country to get involved. The day, April 22nd, was chosen because that was a time when all students would be in school and could more easily participate in events. He later said that, quote, the wire services carried the story from coast to coast. The response was electric. It took off like bank gangbusters. Telegrams, letters, and telephone inquiries poured in from all across the country. The American people finally had a forum to express their concern about what was happening to their land, rivers, lakes, and air, and they did so with spectacular exuberance, end quote. According to Nelson, Earth Day worked because of the spontaneous response at the grassroots level. We had neither the time nor resources to organize 20 million demonstrators and the thousands of schools and local communities that participated. That was the remarkable thing about Earth Day, he said. It organized itself. 
Rallies and events took place in every major city all over the country and included school children, celebrities, politicians, and people from all walks of life. The first Earth Day was effective at raising awareness about environmental issues and transforming public attitudes. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, public opinion polls indicate, indicated that a permanent change in national priorities followed Earth Day 1970. When polled in May of 1971, 25% of the United States public declared that protecting the environment was an important goal, a 2,500% increase over 1969. Earth Day kicked off the environmental decade with a bang. As Senator Nelson later put it, a major development, in part the result of protests sparked by the work of marine biologist Rachel Carson and her book Silent Spring, was the establishment in December 1970 of the Environmental Protection Agency. The mission of the EPA was to protect human health and safeguard the natural environment, air, water, and land. Many other critical pieces of legislation were passed during the 1970s as well including the Clean Air Act, the Water Quality Improvement Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, and the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. Ever since that first Earth Day in 1970, Earth Day celebrations have grown. The Earth Day Network, EDN, is a nonprofit organization that coordinates Earth activities across the globe. They reported in 1990 that Earth Day had gone global with 200 million people and over 140 nations participating. This year, 2021, the theme is Restore Our Earth. The focus is on three things, natural processes. This would be things like weather patterns, um, currents, or ocean currents, ecosystem services such as pollination, natural water filtration through wetlands, etc. The second focus for this year's theme is emerging green technologies. The third is innovative thinking that can restore our Earth's ecosystems. It is up to each and every one of us to restore our Earth, not just because we care about the natural world, but because we live in it. We all need a healthy Earth to support our jobs, our livelihoods, our health and survival, and our happiness. Studies show that people are just happier when they're in nature. Children learn better when they're in nature. We need our nature. Our healthy planet is not an option. It's a necessity. More than 1 billion people in 192 countries now participate in Earth Day activities every year, making it the largest civic observance in the world. I think that's quite an accomplishment. Today, I invite you to participate in Earth Day to help climate action across the globe.